In this video, I will describe how to effectively use ultrasound to assist neuraxial blockade or lumbar puncture in the obese patient. A good understanding of the fundamentals of ultrasound imaging of the spine is required and is covered in other videos. This is a relatively long video, but the description contains links to different sections for those of you that wish to skip ahead. The two main issues in the obese patient are 1. The uncertain locations of relevant landmarks, namely the intercrystal line which allows estimation of intervertebral level, spinous processes which indicate the midline, and the interspinous and interlaminous spaces. Second, the uncertain depth to the vertebral canal which has implications for selection of an appropriately long needle. Ultrasound helps address both these uncertainties and for this reason, it never hurts to do a pre-procedural scan in the obese patient. As with any ultrasound-guided procedure, there are two phases. First, scanning to identify the relevant anatomy, and in the case of spine imaging, marking the location of landmarks on the skin. Second, needle insertion guided by these landmarks with appropriately careful needle handling to ensure that the needle goes where you intend it to. Before I get into a step-by-step -step description of the scanning phase, here are some general principles of ultrasound imaging in the obese patient. Adjust machine settings in anticipation of the increased depth of target structures. Use lower frequencies for better penetration, ensure the focus is set to the appropriate depth, and adjust gain as needed. Apply pressure through the probe to reduce distance to the target structures and to improve image quality. Good ergonomics and appropriate probe grip is essential for control and to avoid fatigue. Regardless of the above measures, images are often of lower quality, in that structures such as the anterior complex are less bright and visible. There are strategies to effectively address this, however. Practice in normal subjects facilitates pattern recognition and interpretation of these more subtle images. There are also more easily identifiable surrogate landmarks that we can use to help locate the midline, interlaminar spaces, and the vertebral canal. Always start with the probe in a longitudinal orientation to obtain the parasagittal oblique view. The objective is to identify the sacrum, the laminae, the interlaminar space, and ultimately the anterior complex of the vertebral canal. The parasagittal oblique view allows me to have a good idea of which intervertebral level I might be targeting and to mark the approximate location of potential interlaminar spaces in case the transverse view is difficult. Start by placing the probe over the sacrum. This can be harder to do than it sounds in the obese patient with no landmarks. The trick is to look for the sacral cleft and ensure that the probe is just cranial to the sacral cleft. This is an example of a parasagittal oblique view in an obese patient. The screen depth is set at 14.4 centimeters. Nevertheless, the sacrum is identifiable as a hyperechoic line. The cranial edge of the sacrum marks the location of the L5 S1 space. The anterior complex in the adults is usually visualized approximately 2 cm deep to the sacrum or laminae. The position of the L5-S1 space should be marked. It is a particularly important space in the obese patient as it is usually the most visible and the most superficial. It is therefore a space of last resort in many patients. Remember, however, that if used for hip or abdominal analgesia, the patient must be positioned appropriately after the spinal anesthetic to achieve adequate cranial spread. Finally, the depth to reach the epidural or intrathecal space can be estimated by either measuring depth to the anterior complex if it is visible, or measuring depth to the sacrum and adding 2 cm. This is an image from another obese patient. Having found the sacrum, in the L5-S1 space, the probe should be slid cranially to visualize the other laminae. From this, 
we can identify the interlaminar gaps, which allows us to count and mark intervertebral levels. Unfortunately, the anterior complexes are not always going to be visible, although careful sliding and tilting of the probe should be undertaken to optimize the image. This again is where practice in the normal patient helps with probe handling. One final example, which will hopefully help reinforce recognition of the patterns that we are looking for. The sacrum is visible at about eight to nine centimeters deep and the L5-S1 anterior complex is faintly visible. Moving cranially, the L5 and L4 lamina come into view with a very small and faint hyperechoic line where we expect the L4, L5 anterior complex to be. This video shows the dynamic process of ultrasound scanning of the parasagittal oblique view in real time. The sacrum and the L5 space is visible. As we move cranially, the other laminae and anterior complexes are visible as previously discussed. Each of these can be centered on the screen and their position marked. Having identified the intervertebral levels and marked them on the skin, the probe is rotated 90 degrees to obtain transverse midline views. Two possible transverse midline views can be obtained. The first is the spinous process view, in which the spinous process and bony lamina cast a dense acoustic shadow that is shaped like a church steeple or tower. The second view is the interspinous view. There is no bone between the probe and the vertebral canal, allowing us to see the structures within, the ligamentum flavum and the dura, which constitute the posterior complex on ultrasound. Note that the articular processes and transverse processes are in the same plane as the interlaminar space. These are important surrogate landmarks that can be recognized on ultrasound. The anterior dura, posterior longitudinal ligament, and posterior aspect of the vertebral body are visible on ultrasound as the hyperechoic anterior complex. The intrathecal space lies just above and the midline is recognizable as a vertical dark stripe between the paraspinous muscles. However, in many obese patients, the anterior complex is often difficult to visualize, as in this example. Surrogate landmarks or indicators of the interspinous and interlaminar space are therefore very useful. The first surrogate landmark or indicator of the interlaminar space is visualization of the superior articular process and transverse process. These lie in the same transverse plane. Note that on the ultrasound image, the anterior complex is roughly at the same depth as the transverse process. Looking again now at the earlier image from the obese patient, we can identify the articular processes and the transverse processes. This should now guide our eye to recognize the faint hyperechoic line of the anterior complex. This video illustrates this principle in real time. Watch as we scan slowly chordate from the upper lumbar spine and a definite spinous process comes into view, recognizable by its acoustic shadow and hyperechoic cap. As we continue scanning, we see hyperechoic structures appear lateral to the spinous process acoustic shadow. These are the articular and transverse processes. The interlaminar space and anterior complex should be visible in the same plane, although as always in the obese patient, the anterior complex may be quite faint. Even if it is not visible, I would be prepared to use this plane as a starting point for midline access to the vertebral canal if no better images could be obtained. The second surrogate indicator of the interspinous view and interlaminar space is the spinous process, or more accurately, the absence of the spinous process acoustic shadow. Even in this most obese patient, the spinous process can always be identified. For example, 
in this patient, there is over four centimeters of subcutaneous tissue, but the acoustic shadow of the spinous process is still visible. Shifting the probe cranial or cordate will bring us into the interlaminar view, which is characterized by the absence of the acoustic shadow of the spinous process. The anterior complex should now be visible, although it may be very faint and subtle. Another clue is that the anterior complex in the transverse midline view will lie at the same depth as the anterior complexes in the parasagittal oblique view. I showed you this image earlier of the parasagittal oblique view from this same patient in which we identified the sacrum and used it to identify the anterior complex of the L5-S1 space approximately 2 cm deeper to the edge of the sacrum. The anterior complex in the transverse midline view is located at that same depth of 12.3 cm. These subtle anterior complexes are easier to recognize during dynamic scanning in the transverse midline view. What we are looking for are grey or white lines to appear out of the darkness of the acoustic shadow as we slide the probe cranially or caudally. I showed the first part of this patient's video earlier, in which we identified the sacrum, the laminae, and anterior complexes of the L2 to L5 spaces. In the transfer scan, we see first a spinous process view with a dense acoustic shadow. And then, as the probe is slid into the interspinous view, an anterior complex appears. It is not unusual for this to be sometimes slightly off-center, as here. Skin markings are then made to indicate the midline and the transverse plane in which the interlaminar space lies. The intersection of these lines is where the needle should be inserted. By now, some of you are probably shaking your head and questioning the value of ultrasound in the obese patient if the images are always going to be so hard to interpret. I will not argue that it is difficult and it does take a fair amount of experience to be able to recognize articular processes and transverse processes such as in this image or even more so in this image. And from there, to infer that an anterior complex may be just visible if you look hard enough. If you are struggling though, the good news is that spinous processes are always visible and distinct, even in the most obese of patients. And they are a very useful landmark to identify, as I will show you. The spinous process is recognizable as an elongated acoustic shadow with a hyperechoic reflection from its tip. It is therefore possible to image and mark the location of the midline in two successive spinous processes on the skin. Logically, the interlaminar space will lie between these two marks. It is therefore a good place for initial needle insertion. The tip of the spinous process is actually an elongated structure about 1 to 2 centimeters in length. This technique can therefore be refined further by scanning cradily and caudally to see where the hyperechoic apex and acoustic shadow disappears. This allows us to mark a rectangle rather than a line that indicates the location of the spinous processes. As before, an appropriate needle insertion point is between the spinous processes in the midline. The same principle can also be used for a paramedian or paraspinous approach, especially where narrowed spaces are contributing to an inability to visualize the anterior complex. Instead of marking a point in the midline, we mark instead a point half a centimeter lateral to the midline and in line with the upper edge of a spinous process or just slightly above. The needle is then inserted with a very slight lateral to medial angle of five to 10 degrees and angled progressively cranially to walk into the interlaminar space. This is illustrated here. The needle insertion point is half a centimeter lateral to the midline 
and cranial to the marking of the lower spinous process. A 5 to 10 degree lateral to medial angulation and appropriate cranial angulation takes the needle into the vertebral canal. The last point I wish to make before we leave scanning and move on to needling is that when estimating the depth of the space and length of needle required, remember to account for tissue compression. This can be significant in the obese patient. The spinous process in the image on the left lies 3 cm below the skin. However, when pressure on the probe is released, the actual depth increases to 5 cm. If only the spinous process is visible, depth can be estimated based on the fact that the average adult lumbar spinous process is approximately 4 cm tall. So in this patient, depth of the lamina is at least 9 cm and a needle that is longer than the standard 90mm one will be required. Now that we've discussed how to scan for and mark the location of the vertebral landmarks in an obese patient, we move on to the needling phase. Precision with needling is important as being off by a few millimeters can make all the difference between success and failure. In this obese gentleman with a BMI of 65, we scan and mark his midline and his spinous processes. However, there was a surgical delay, so he was allowed to lie back down and was later set up again for the spinal. Initial attempts using the original markings were unsuccessful because the skin was now in a slightly different position. We re-scanned as a rescue and determined the new position of the midline and interlaminar spaces. He also had narrow spaces, which required quite a large degree of cranial angulation as well for entry. But what is important is that you can see that the difference between failure and success is minimal. So even if the location of the midline and interlaminar space has been marked accurately on the skin, the needle can still fail to enter the space for two main reasons. One is failure to advance the needle in a straight line, which is exacerbated by the tendency of the needle to deflect as it is advanced through tissue, or operator failure to keep it advancing in a straight line. Never let the needle bend as you insert it. Here, this operator is struggling to replace the stylet into his spinal needle. And the reason he is struggling is because the spinal needle is now curved or bent within the tissues. Controlled insertion without excessive force is the key to avoiding this problem. The second thing to be careful of is making excessively large changes in needle trajectory. Here, this change in trajectory angle is sufficient to walk the needle tip off the spinous process and into the interlaminar space. In the obese patient with thicker overlying tissues, the same change in trajectory angle results in a much larger displacement of the needle tip and contact with the upper spinous process rather than entry into the interlaminar space. Being precise and meticulous is therefore paramount in the obese patient and any redirections must be very small and controlled. In another video on the fundamentals of spinal anesthesia and lumbar puncture, I have emphasized the importance of controlling the overlying skin with two fingers of your non-dominant hand for palpation and fixation. Do not use your thumb to palpate as it serves little additional purpose. The two finger palpation and fixation technique also applies if you are using a 20 gauge or 22 gauge spinal needle. With the patient in the lateral position, your hand is rotated, but the same two fingers are used to control the skin. In the video on fundamentals of spinal anesthesia and lumbar puncture, I also emphasize the importance of establishing where the midline is. If you are in the true midline, you will have placed your needle into the interspinous ligament. If you are off the midline, you will have placed your needle into the adjacent paraspinal muscle. Further progress will be impeded by the laminar or articular processes. Always use your local anesthetic infiltration needle as a seeker or finder needle. If you are in the midline, you will either contact bone or you will be unable to inject any fluid as your needle tip will be in the supraspinous or interspinous ligament.
if you are off the midline, you will be in paraspinal muscle and you will be able to inject fluid. Make parallel shifts of the needle to locate the midline and don't hesitate to make a new skin puncture if necessary. An additional advantage of the two finger palpation technique is that it can be used to compress the tissues and in all but the very obese, the tip of the spinous process or the supraspinous ligament can be engaged with a one and a half inch or four centimeter infiltration needle. Many longer small gauge spinal needles come with their own introducer. If this has a lure lock hub, take advantage of this to attach a syringe and seek the same resistance to fluid injection that comes with placing the needle into the interspinous ligament. When using a long 25 gauge or 27 gauge needle, be very meticulous about handling it to ensure that it advances in a straight line and does not bend or deflect. The needle should not be held at its hub, but rather along its shaft. A two-handed grip on the needle is not appropriate as one hand always needs to control the introducer, which is responsible for directing the trajectory of the needle. The simplest method is to grasp the shaft close to its insertion point. I also nestle the hub of the needle within my palm to further stabilize it. The needle should be fed in slowly and incrementally as shown, paying careful attention to tactile feedback from the needle tip, which gives important clues about the type of tissue that you are passing through skin, subcutaneous tissue, muscle, ligament, or ligamentum flavum. A 22 gauge or larger needle has the advantage of being stiffer, less likely to deflect, and thus easier to manipulate in small incremental redirections. Nevertheless, careful handling is still needed. Always use a quinky tip, not a pencil point, which takes too much force to advance, sacrificing control of the needle. Unlike a regular length needle, two hands are needed for needle stability, and therefore, I do not fix the skin with my other hand when inserting the needle. Rather, I ensure that the marks have been made with the skin in the neutral position, and am then meticulous about inserting it without distorting or stretching the skin out of this position. Note too that I use the incremental feeding motion to advance the needle with my left hand, while my right hand supports the hub and keeps the needle in a straight line. This technique also gives me tactile feedback from the needle tip. When making redirections, always withdraw the needle into the loose superficial tissues before altering the trajectory. I use the index finger of my left hand not only to support the needle, but also to act as a fulcrum to make a controlled change in angle. To recap, use both hands to hold the needle and keep it straight at all times. Insert the needle in small incremental motions for maximum control and feel. If bone is contacted, withdraw the needle into the superficial tissues and make small adjustments in trajectory angle using the supporting hand as a fulcrum to control those changes in trajectory angle. A final few tips to end. When you strike bone, and you will strike bone at some point in some patients, use this to gather information and map the bony contours of the vertebra. Ask yourself, what bony surface is this? And confirm it by making a direction and see what happens. If you are on the spinous process, cranial angulation should take you progressively deeper. If you are off the midline and walking up the lamina, it will feel like you are striking bone at the same depth each time. If you are very far off the midline, you may strike the facet joint, which will elicit pain on that ipsilateral side.
Although the skin and subcutaneous tissues of obese patients are often relatively firm and less mobile than the thin elderly person, sometimes the overlying skin and tissues can be very mobile, even in the sitting position as seen here. This patient also has an unusual shelf of soft tissue. When scanning and marking the position of landmarks, therefore, one needs to be very careful that the tissues are in their natural position before marking it. And similarly, when inserting the needle, care must be taken to ensure the tissues are not moved out of their natural position. Finally, when inserting the needle, also be aware of the patient position relative to the horizontal plane. As can be seen here, this patient is leaning forward and thus a perpendicular insertion actually involves directing the needle down towards the surface of the bed. Staying parallel to the surface of the bed would be a cranial angulation of the needle. The same applies in the lateral position. If the patient is leaning away from you, and sometimes this is actually an advantage because they are then more stable, then this must be taken into account when advancing the needle to keep it in the midline. So in summary, to effectively use ultrasound imaging in obese patients, one must have first practiced the technique in patients with normal body habitus, so as to learn how to recognize subtle image patterns of the parasagittal oblique and transverse midline views. Use surrogate markers of the interlaminar space such as articular processes, transverse processes, spinous processes, when image quality is poor. Meticulous scanning and skin marking is essential as inaccuracies are magnified in the obese patient due to the greater needle insertion depths. And for the same reasons, meticulous needle handling is essential. Finally, even though these techniques will solve most difficulties, there will always be a few patients in whom neuraxial blockade is near impossible. It is therefore important to know when to stop persisting. General anesthesia is always an option. What follows is a bonus video that further illustrates the value of ultrasound imaging in the patient with difficult surface landmarks. This is a video from one of our studies of novice practitioners attempting spinal anesthesia in patients with difficult surface landmarks. It has been sped up eight times for convenience. Note the suboptimal needle handling and lack of a systematic problem solving approach to reinsertions. Following the fifth unsuccessful attempt, as per study protocol, ultrasound-assisted rescue was performed. The midline was identified and marked. The interlaminar space was also identified and marked. You will see that I take pains to be very precise and actually adjust my transverse marking based on identification of the most optimal image. I fix the skin as always to prevent any movement. <laughs> 
I managed to contact the tip of the spinous process with the introducer needle. Cranial angulation is then adjusted slightly to walk up over the spinous process and resistance to injection is obtained, confirming that the needle is in the midline. The rest of the procedure is now a formality. Thank you for watching. Further resources on ultrasound imaging of the spine can be found by following the links on this page.